Hello everyone, this is Nitpicky Nerd, and today I want to review something very interesting I found on YouTube. There's a channel called Sid City, which is run by Alexander Siddig, who played Dr. Julian Bashir on Deep Space Nine, which is my second favorite Star Trek show. My favorite one is TNG, but I do admit that Deep Space Nine in many ways was even better, especially in the later seasons, the first seasons were a bit weaker. And one of the best uh, things about the show was the fact that it had so many great uh, characters and the actors were great. Unfortunately, some of them are no longer with us and I really doubt there will ever be any kind of official sequel to Deep Space Nine. But some of these actors have banded together maybe because of the situation and uh, through the internet they are actually filming kind of a fan fiction sequel to Deep Space Nine and the videos are on the channel Seed City which I will link below. And I just finished watching the third episode, so I will review all three episodes and I will say what I like, what I dislike. But first of all, I really want to thank all these actors who did this uh, for free, I presume, and they do it for the fans. And so that's great. So I really want to thank them for uh, spending their free time to do this. This is a great gift to the fans. I greatly appreciate it, I enjoyed uh, most of this, even though I do have a few complaints. But uh, most of the acting was pretty excellent. The way they read their lines, you really feel like uh, they are in character and uh, it all seems to be filmed in one take and so it's pretty impressive how well they deliver it. Now they don't wear any alien makeup but it's hard to blame them and uh, it's not a big deal. I can easily accept Andrew Robinson as Garrick even without the makeup and the uh, Ciro Clofton appears as Jake and looks the part uh, pretty well. It's a good thing that he is now bald and kind of gained weight a little bit because he actually looks more like Avery Brooks did when he did Deep Space Nine and so that's actually great. Now some of his line delivery was a bit weaker than the other actors. Maybe it's part to do with the dialogue, I'll get to that, some of my complaints. And the uh, Nana Visitor appeared in episode 3 as the intendant from the Mirror Universe and that was great. I never thought I'd see that character again and she was actually great. And Alexander and Andrew are great as Bashir and Garek. You know, that was one of the most interesting character friendships uh, in the show and so it's great to see this. And most of their line delivery was excellent, even surprisingly so, because I would think, you know, they have a lot of techno bubble dialogue and all of that, and they seem to easily do it well. Maybe they did a lot of reversals before they recorded this, but it seems to be all in one take, and it's uh, pretty much flawless. And as for the story and dialogue, it's mostly good, and it has a lot of uh, correct attention to detail, a lot of little details of things from the show which they do correctly and so whoever wrote this was obviously a big fan of Deep Space Nine and it's really refreshing to see something that feels like an actual sequel to the old show and not some reimagining. So most of the story and dialogue are pretty good and with a lot of attention to detail which they get correctly. Now I do still have a few complaints. First of all some of it feels a little bit like uh, fan fiction in the sense that uh, almost every character became something uh, epic, something great, you know, uh, Bashir is now in Starfleet Intelligence, Garrick is the leader of Cardassia, Jake is the main reporter of the Federation, Kira Neris is the Kai of Bajor, she's the leader of Bajor, and so they kind of boost up all of their characters kind of too much into an unrealistic level, and so it kind of takes me out of it a little bit, it reminds me that this is basically fan fiction, this is the way that fans would write these characters, that every single character who happened to be on Deep Space Nine station at some point, they all became leaders of their planets or organizations and all of that, that's a little bit too much. So Garak is the leader of Cardassia, Kira is the Kai on Bajor, O'Brien was mentioned that he's a professor in the academy, now they do establish that it's been 25 years uh, since Deep Space Nine ended, so I guess a lot of things could have happened during that time, and so it's kind of plausible, but still kind of uh, over-exaggerated just a little bit. There are also references to events that happened in Star Trek Picard, such as the Romulans trying to exterminate the androids, and I kind of like it that they are tying everything together, and they're not ignoring anything, they're kind of uh, respecting everything in the franchise even though I have problems with Star Trek Picard but I'm not sure I would want it totally ignored like I appreciate the fact that they pay so much attention to the detail even to the new shows not just to Deep Space Nine and they pay a lot of attention to all the details except for one bit which I think they might have missed that Quark was actually mentioned in Star Trek Picard in episode 5 of that show Quark was mentioned as a Quark of Ferenginar and also we saw that Quark's bar is now apparently a franchise 
that exist even on that planet of uh, free cloud. And yet in these videos they mention that Quark is still on the station, still running a bar on the station. So it's not a direct contradiction, it's possible that Quark uh, still has his headquarters on the station, that's his main bar, and he still has a lot of other bars on other planets, and maybe he's said to be from Ferenginar simply because that's uh, where he's from originally. So it's not a direct mistake, but uh, I found that a little bit iffy, that whoever wrote this probably missed the fact that Quark was mentioned in Star Trek Picard. And if not for that ad reference, maybe I simply would think they are ignoring Star Trek Picard, and yet they specifically mention the Romulan Shrine to exterminate the androids, and so that means they acknowledge Star Trek Picard, and if that is the case, then they should acknowledge all of it. And so the mention of Quark still being on the station is a little bit strange, and also just logically, would he really still want to live there after so many decades, and so that's a little bit strange, especially if his brother is the Grand Nego, so didn't Quark always want to own a moon and stuff, so wouldn't he have his own moon by now? Why is he still uh, stuck on the station? So I will now talk about uh, the plot and the story in these videos. They're basically, all the characters are talking with each other through subspace, that's why they're not in the same room. And so I guess the story had to be in such a way to allow this. And so the plot is basically that Cardassia was infected by a virus and it's under lockdown and there's a lot of secrecy because Garak doesn't want uh, the population to know about it or other planets to know about it. So this is obviously, I guess, meant to be similar to real life events happening today. And I always say I'm not sure that's a good thing for Star Trek to do. I mean, Star Trek always had allegories and metaphors to all kinds of political topics. But uh, this is kind of too soon. Like this is happening now in reality. And we always watch Star Trek as kind of escapism. And so seeing a story which is almost identical or very similar to what's actually happening today, I'm not so sure it's a good thing for a show which is supposed to be escapism in science fiction. So I'm not so sure it was a good idea to be so relevant for today that it's basically about the pandemic on Cardassia, but it was kind of funny at the same time, so I don't know, I have some mixed feelings on that. But maybe they try too hard to be relevant for today, and so there's a virus on Cardassia, and uh, Bashir tries to help Garek, tries to tell him how to deal with it, and Garek uh, always tries to keep everything secret and all of that. Uh, the problem in the first episode, I felt like some of the dialogue was going in circles a little bit too long. I mean, we get the same kind of information again and again, and they go back and forth about all the details. Now, all the personal interactions were great, meaning uh, how they respond to each other, how they talk uh, as friends, and all of that was great because we have all that background from Deep Space Nine. We know these characters, we know they are friends and all of that, so all those nuances, all their interactions, as friends were great, but all the technical stuff, all the techno bubble, which usually I like in Star Trek, I don't mind, you know, just watching two characters talk techno bubble, but some of this uh, in the first episode of their show, in these videos, uh, was a little bit too long and going in circles a few times, like they're going over the same points again and again, a little bit too much, and so it became a little bit boring in the first episode. But uh, the personal touches of their conversations uh, were pretty interesting. So fans who love these characters in Deep Space Nine will probably enjoy these videos. But if you're just a casual Star Trek fan and not specifically of these characters, maybe you will find a lot of this kind of boring. And at some point uh, Julian tells Garrick that uh, Ezri Dax died. And Dax is now inside of a man and uh, he, Bashir, is now with that man. And he says, I never thought I would ever be in love with another man, but this is Dax and all of that. And that kind of made me chuckle a little bit. I mean, uh, I have no problem with showing, you know, gay representation and all of that. But I think it felt a little bit forced. I mean, it has nothing to do with the story. And so this is just a mention just for the sake of it. And that's exactly one of the things I was complaining in the official Star Trek shows, which constantly do that all the time now. And so seeing it here as well kind of made me roll my eyes a little bit. But the idea of using Dax for that is actually good. That's actually, that's something I said even uh, back in my reviews of Deep Space Nine. I was saying that was the biggest missed opportunity of season seven when they killed off Jadzia and replaced her with another woman when it, that should have been a man. That would have made it so much more interesting to see all that dynamic because, you know, even when the show started, that was the backstory of that character. She said she used to be a man and she's now a woman. And she understands men because of that and all of that. And so that was the perfect opportunity. They should have done this in season seven. Replace Dax with a man and also see how that uh, affects all the relationships and all of that. But uh, I guess Rick Berman didn't want to let them do that. And they just replaced her with another woman, Ezri. 
So I guess maybe they're correcting it now in this online story when Bashir says that Ezri died also and the uh, Dax moved to a man body and Bashir was with that man until the thrill authorities found out about it and so the relationship is forbidden. That is kind of a nice metaphor. It reminds me of that episode of Deep Place Nine called Rejoined, which was basically a metaphor to homosexuality and all of that, that uh, Dax uh, is still in love with uh, a wife of an older host and so they want to get back together but it's forbidden not because it's a woman and a woman but because it's forbidden for the thrill to resume relationships from a previous host and so Bashir tells that uh, they cannot be together he cannot be with that man because of that not because of the fact that it's a man and so that was uh, the same kind of way to talk about uh, you know discrimination and all of that without directly saying it's because of the gender and they all behave as if that's not a problem at all in the future. So that is an interesting, and that is a good way to do that. Because you can still talk about the issues without it being too much on the nose and being more of a science fiction idea, which also has a little bit of a message uh, about today, but without being too direct about it. And that is also more interesting. And so in the end of the day, I thought it didn't really have any part in the actual story, but it was interesting. And that is something I wish they would have done in season seven. And later on, Garak also told the story, which kind of made me laugh, and that also really reminds me of all kinds of strange fanfiction, which I remember reading many years ago uh, after Deep Space Nine. There were a lot of fanfiction on the internet, playing with all these characters, saying that uh, in between episodes they were secretly together and all of that. So Garak and Bashir was one of the usual pairings, and uh, Garak in this video... Andrew Robinson as Garrick starts telling about uh, that one time when Ducat was on the station, when they were on the station together before the show, before the series, that they were on Terra Knorr together and one day Garrick and uh, Gold Ducat got drunk and got into a fight and then ended up sleeping together. And that made me kind of chuckle because uh, and it reminds me of a lot of fan fiction I used to read about uh, Star Trek and Deep Space Nine which always had those kind of strange relationships as if in between episodes, as if off screen. So I always kind of laughed at those kinds of fan fiction. So seeing Andrew Robinson as Garrick telling such a story now is kind of funny to me. And we can explain it a way of maybe Garrick just joking around. Maybe he's not being serious. And uh, I don't think I can take it seriously because, you know, Garrick and Ducat were always enemies on Deep Space Nine. They hated each other. So hearing that they actually got drunk once and slept together is not really believable in my opinion. But you know, these are Cardassians, and we do know from some episodes that uh, for Cardassians, hostility actually arouses them. We had that episode in which O'Brien was uh, in conflict with some uh, Cardassian woman. He kept uh, shouting at her, and then she got aroused and tried to sleep with him, so that was funny. So I guess for Cardassians, hostility translates into arousal, and since they hate each other, maybe that actually would be plausible because they're aliens, so who knows. So I guess I can accept that, but I found it funny. So I choose to look at it as kind of a joke. Maybe Garrick just uh, said that as a joke, but who knows. I guess uh, Goldamar was really attracted to Kira because he was always angry at her, so maybe he secretly wanted to be with Kira because uh, for Cardassians, being angry is a sign of attraction. So there's a lot of stuff here that seems like fan fiction and when Jake shows up he says that he's the editor-in-chief of the Federation News Service and he's also a famous novelist that everyone, every character who he mentions, he says uh, commented on his recent novels so everybody reads his novels, he's such a famous novelist that everybody enjoys his books and he's the editor-in-chief of the entire Federation News Network. And the uh, Grand Negus Rome was mentioned, and that's something that was in the show itself, so I can't really complain about it, but they kind of went overboard with all of this, so every single character that they mentioned became something great and epic and all of that. There was also a small continuity mistake, I would say, with the franchise, because uh, Jake mentioned something about Andoria. They were talking about it as if it's some separate power in the Quadrant and not part of the Federation which is a continuity mistake with Enterprise, in which it was mentioned that the Andorians were one of the founding members of the Federation. And it was also mentioned in Deep Space Nine itself, in a dialogue by uh, Kai Wynn, who said that Andor is a Federation planet. And yet, in these videos, they talk about Andoria as if it's something totally separate. Now, since this is two decades later, maybe they left the Federation, I guess it's possible, but then it should have been mentioned. 
And if they were just talking about Andorians in general, we can assume maybe it's some uh, rogue Andorians who are not uh, part of uh, the Federation, but they mentioned Andoria itself by name, and so it made it sound as if it's not part of the Federation, so I think it was a mistake. And uh, Jake uh, constantly mentions that he's a novelist and all of that. That got a little bit annoying because it was repetitive. The same problem I mentioned before with uh, dialogue going in circles. I mean, one mention of that would have been great. If they just said it once, I would have said that's great attention to detail. You remember that he's supposed to be a writer and all of that. So one mention would have been great. Even two mentions would have been fine. But I think they mentioned it uh, numerous times. My recent novel. He commented on my recent novel. And that one commented on my recent novel. And so it kept going and going. So that was a little bit annoying. And also Jake uh, has connections on all the planets, he knows Romulans, he knows Klingons, he knows Bajorans, he knows everyone in the galaxy. So they kind of made Jake uh, way overpowered. He's the head of the Federation Youth Service and he's also in connection with important people in the intelligence community. And so he knows it all and all of that, so it was uh, very unbelievable. And also they had a line about Quark knowing that Senator Vrinak from the episode in the pale moonlight was on the station before he died and that I think is a kind of a continuity mistake because the way they met the senator was totally in secret, no one knew about it, even though I guess Quark did meet that guy who was uh, making that hologram for the senator so maybe he got drunk and told him about it, so I guess it's plausible but that makes uh, Ben Sisko seem kind of sloppy, I mean he went to all the trouble of uh, setting up all that rules and all of that only for Quark to know about it in the end, so I found that a little bit unbelievable. But uh, I was kind of glad to see that they're doing kind of a sequel to that story, so they're connecting all the dots, they're doing a continuation, a sequel with all these important events in mind, and so that is kind of interesting. But Quark knowing about Vrinak, about him being on the station, when that whole meeting was done in secret, that seems kind of sloppy on Cisco's part, and so that's why I don't really like it. And in episode 3 they mentioned that Bashir is now in section 31 and not in Starfleet Intelligence as was previously said and that he rises in the ranks of section 31 and uh, he's doing that to prevent it from doing evil stuff from within or something and I don't really like this idea. This is similar to what I heard uh, of the planned season 8 of Deep Space Nine by the writers of Deep Space Nine. They were planning to make uh, Bashir the head of Section 31. I didn't like that idea because from what we saw in the show he hated Section 31. He wanted to destroy it. He even stole that information from Sloan's mind which he said is going to use to bring down Section 31. So now we find out he's actually in Section 31 and rising in ranks and all of that. That doesn't seem very believable. I don't think he would do that, even if it was just to destroy it from within and all of that, it's still not really, like, why would they believe him if they knew what he was planning before, and so it doesn't really make much sense. They also mentioned Koval, who was the head of the Tal Shiar in Season 7 of Deep Space Nine, and he was also working for Starfleet, together with Section 31, I presume, and they imply that he's the one who infected the Cardassians with the virus, and they say it's a similar virus to the Quickening, which we saw Bashir cure once on a planet which uh, the Dominion infected and when he met Koval, Koval was interested in that virus and he was asking how to introduce it to the population. So this is a very nice and interesting reference. And they also mentioned that the victims seem to be bubbling and uh, talking unclearly and that reminds me of a different virus which O'Brien once got in uh, Season 1 of Deep Space Nine. So I wonder if they're connecting it with that as well somehow. So I'm really curious where all of this is going. So overall, a lot of very good attention to detail, with a few minor mistakes, as I mentioned. And in episode 3, Nana Visitor shows up as Kira from the Mirror Universe, the Intendant, who was also recruited by Section 31, and that also made me roll my eyes a little bit, because it reminds me of that uh, character from Star Trek Discovery, who came from the Mirror Universe and then joined Section 31, and she's been evil for no reason and all of that. It seemed to be the same thing here and so that annoyed me a little bit, but it is good to see Nana Visitor again and her acting is excellent as the Kira from the Mirror Universe. That's probably more interesting than the regular Kira acting wise and so in that sense it's a good thing. But story wise it's not really believable why would Section 31 recruit uh, that character who was always shown to be so crazy and psychotic and all of that. Why would they recruit her? And so I have the same problem here as I did with Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery, in which uh, Philippa Giorgio 
who is totally nuts, uh, was somehow recruited to Section 31, and so I don't really like that kind of plot element. But seeing Nana Visitor again was great. And I really hope that maybe Avery Brooks will show up later in one of these videos, that will really be excellent in my opinion. So I'm really curious to see where this is going, how many episodes it will have. I don't think this is perfect, I think uh, some people might not enjoy it, but if you're a big fan of these characters and these actors, you definitely will enjoy it. So uh, check it out, I will give the links in the description below. And I also want to mention something similar which I saw a while ago, which was made by the actor James McAvoy, which is a parody of Star Trek, and every character, every actor is filming his part uh, in his own home, I guess, and they're doing it in such a way which is really funny, it's really kind of cheap looking, and yet creative at the same time. And I think I enjoyed that more than I did the Deep Space Nine videos, because uh, the McAvoy videos are really funny, and it's like a parody, he's basically playing like a captain of a starship, and they make it look as if they're going down to a planet which is like the Wild West, and, uh, and they're doing all kinds of camera tricks to show as if they're interacting with each other, so someone can punch someone, and you can see that it's his own hand punching himself, and all that kind of stuff, which makes it even funnier. So it's very kind of cheap looking, and yet creative, at the same time, and really funny, and like a parody of Star Trek. They called it Star Force, and McAvoy sitting on a chair which looks a lot like uh, the captain's uh, chair from the original Star Trek, and the way he's acting and all of that is really like a good parody. So I think I enjoyed those videos even more than these Deep Space Nine videos, because in these ones uh, we're just seeing the characters talk to each other through the screen, but they don't really do anything physical. This was fun as well, but the McAvoy videos I think are more entertaining overall, and I will review them in a separate video in the near future as well. So that's it for today, let me know what you think in the comments below and we can discuss it. If you enjoy my videos, please hit the like button, please subscribe, click the notification bell if you want to see updates of new videos, check out my other channels, all the links are in the description below, and I will see you all next time. Bye bye!